this is one of those days that doesn't take too long to get through communion and uh, <laughs> offering. It's like, okay, well, I, let's, it's cold. It is cold, I admit that. Uh, you all went out this morning. If you had the same issue we did, we got to open the door, and you're, you have to force that thing open, right, just to almost need a, a crowbar or something to do it. But so glad you all y'all are here this morning because I know we have to sacrifice sometimes our, our warmth, our comfort, and, and you know what? That's not a lot to ask. Amen. Exactly, exactly. Uh, we've we've been sacrificed in a much uh, for in a much greater way, amen. So I'm just so glad y'all here this morning. And you now last week was fun. We talked about uh, uh, a an instrument called the shofar. You gotta remember that last week uh, that we're here. And the shofar was this trumpet that that God would use, and um, He had used it in, in multiple uh, multiple ways. But most of the time, it was to announce His power, His glory. Um, it, it, it was blown uh, um, before he would um, announce his presence, and it was a powerful thing. And I actually thought about uh, taking some lessons, but I don't want to subject you to that and uh, play that this morning. So uh, anyways, we're going we're gonna to move on from that. And, and we've been, uh, l- last week we started talking about the sounds of Scripture, Scripture sounds. And you know, it's really interesting when you start looking at, at Scripture and you, you see the um, you read about some of the different sounds, and, and you know there's, there's a lot more to it than just the sound itself. And in fact, today we're going to dive straight into Scripture. We're, we're going to uh, start out in, in Ezekiel 10, 1 through 5. So if you want to read along with me, you can see it up on the, on the screen, or you can read it in your Bible. But let, let's, let's start out with uh, what, what's happening here. It says in Ezekiel 10, 1 through 5, it says, I looked, and I saw the likeness of a throne of lapis lazuli above the vault that was over the heads of the cherubim. The Lord said to the man clothed in linen, Go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And as I watched, he went in. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple, and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And over the years, I've, I've found the Bible to be kind of like this tapestry. You know, you don't see tapestries too often. I know growing up, we actually had a tapestry, and um, they're really intricate when you look at them. Um, they're interwoven, and if you pay close attention, you can actually see the different patterns that were used and, and the imagery that's happening. How many of you all have ever had a tapestry, by, by the way? Anybody ever, ever had one? Okay. Um, see, that's how it is with Scripture. And, and the, this interwoven nature of what God is doing and what he has done is amazing. And once you see these patterns that develop, you realize how masterful a plan that, that he has. And that's really what I want, I want you to think about as we talk about these sounds of Scripture, about how he is, he is just weaving and he is building this, this whole thing, this, this whole idea for us. And this idea, of course, ultimately is about our salvation. But that's how I really felt when I started studying for the text this morning. When I started looking at them a little bit closer, you started seeing how things just wove together. And in this this, this series where we're dealing with sounds from the Bible, the sound that we are focusing on today is actually found in Ezekiel 10.5, which I just read to you. And let me just sum it up. And it says, The sound of the wings of the cherubim, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. Now, Many people, when you, you hear the word cherub, okay, you, you think of these uh, cute, harmless little little children. In fact, I'm gonna. Uh, there should be. There's a little picture of one, right? Oh, there's the baby cherub, so cute looking. How many of y'all have, have had like a little doll or something like that? You know, um, you know something that, that just looks so so cute, and you want to give it to your baby, and oh, look, they're, they're the baby cherub. You know that kind of thing. And and you know, you look at this thing, and and it's like, wow, that thing is just so cute. You know, they have little tiny wings on their back. 
And, and you know, we, we look at that, that picture, and, and I, I want to say something. We have to be perfectly clear that cherubs look absolutely nothing like that, by the way. Somebody got this idea, hey, let's market these little baby cherubs, you know? These little things with the little wings, and they're so cute, and they're going to protect my baby and all that kind of stuff. And yes, they do that, but here's the deal is that they're not harmless. They're not cute. They're very powerful. In fact, they're, they're very intimidating angels. And in fact, here's a more accurate depiction that's going to pop up here of what a cherubim actually looks like. Now, if you look at this thing, imagine if you bought this animal, I say an animal, but a stuffed animal or something like that, or, or figurine, and you gave it to your baby, like, oh, what are you doing? You know, what is this thing? You know, I mean, you're just all scared. I, who'd want that? I really, I like the baby. You know, there's a show before, I, I like the baby Jesus better than the real Jesus, right? Okay, but that's how they're talking about here. I like the baby cherubim better than the real cherubim. This thing is ugly looking. It's got four heads, by the way, okay, four different heads. And this is not something that you would want to mess with. And in Ezekiel 10, we have one of these confusing visions in Scripture where God, he paints a very specific vision for the Jews, though, in a picture. See, see, here's the thing is that in this, this section, in Ezekiel 10, you have to understand that God was ticked. God was ticked off, and he'd been ticked at them for, for several decades now. In fact, Judah had been sinning for years and years and years, committing idolatry. Uh, they were shedding innocent blood. And, and finally, God had enough. He was done with what was happening with, with Judah. He was done with his, what his people were doing. And in this, this vision, God orders fire that we read before to be taken from among the cherubim and scattered all over the city in punishment for their sins. And later in Ezekiel 11, uh, we read that the glory of the Lord actually departs from the city. So he, he was like, listen, I've put up with this for long enough, with your idolatry, with the, the murdering, with all the stuff that you're doing, all these things I told you not to do, you are doing, and I'm done. I'm out of here. That's exactly what happened. Before that happened, though, he used these cherubim, and we're going to talk about this they seem, these cherubim seem to be everywhere in this passage, in, in this vision that Ezekiel is talking about here. And in fact, I think they're probably mentioned more in this, this area, in Ezekiel 9, 10, 11, than probably almost combined throughout the rest of Scripture. So we read about that, and we're not told too much about them. But it is obvious. One thing is obvious is that these are scary beings. These are, these are not something to be messed with, and these are not little baby fluffy things, okay? So, I mean, even the sound of their wings is scary. The sound is almost like the voice of God himself is what it's saying. And, and the sound of these wings of these angels was really like the sound of judgment. So let me repeat this. Cherubs, they are powerful, they're intimidating, and you don't mess with them. So... They're such powerful creatures, in fact, um, that it's little wonder why people actually try to worship angels. Do we have angel worship around? Yeah, we do, okay? Listen, we, we, have, we have this idea that um, some people will actually look to angels more so than they look to God. And we have to understand that worshiping angels is actually idolatry. So let's get back into um, what even the Apostle John ran into when he was in uh, talking to us about what the visions that he saw, okay, in, in Revelation, Revelation 22, 8 through 9. Listen to what John says here. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you, and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So even the most spiritual person, and we're talking about John here, right? He could be tempted to, to try to worship angels. And in fact, Scripture tells us that there is one angel 
who actually wanted to be worshipped. In Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15, we read about this angel. Do you know who that angel was? It was Satan, okay? And this is what God says about Satan in, in 12 through 15. It says, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. Now, isn't that interesting that Satan, you know, he was, he was a cherub. Satan was a cherubim. He was one of these crazy looking things, right? Okay, not, not fluffy, fluffy baby cherub, okay? He was one of these, these mean looking you know, just intimidating, scary things, okay? That's who Satan was. And I don't quite know what to make out of that, except that he was honored, okay? When we read this, we can tell that he was an honored cherub, okay? He was uh, a beautiful angel, though, okay? And we sit there, I'm sitting there saying they're ugly, but, you know, honestly, it's it's a pretty, pretty uh, amazing thing when he's, if he, we were to see one of these things come down, we'd be amazed, wouldn't we? We would be. But he, he really was a beautiful angel. But here's the thing is that he felt he deserved praise and glory and honor and power. And he felt he des- deserved it more so than God. That's what we have to look at that is that he, he realized he was probably one of these really cocky kind of, kind of angels, right? Like, yeah, look at me. I got my gold. I'm dressed pretty awesome here, right? Okay. I'm powerful. You know what? Why are, why are all these people... Why, why let them worship God when I'm awesome, right? That's exactly how Satan was. He was just all about himself. He wanted to be God. And we have to understand, though, who angels were and why they were created. Hebrews 1.14 tells, tells us that are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Listen to what that says. Who were who were created to serve? Who were they created to serve? Us. So, so you've got Satan, and Satan thinks he's this awesome angel dude, right? Okay, and he's just he all dressed up, and yeah, look at me. Okay, I got four wings. Humans don't have this kind of thing, right? Okay, I mean, listen, I can go and fly around. I can do anything I want, right? <laughs> Probably played sports. <laughs> but the thing is, is they were not created. Yes, they were created. They were not created to be honored and worshipped. They were created to serve. Amen. So there are Bible scholars that actually believe that Satan's job was to serve God's creation. In fact, they think that Lucifer's job was to actually oversee and protect this world. Okay, that's, that's what a lot of different Bible scholars believe. And Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 tells us what happened to him, though. Listen to this. This is... This is Another prophet here, Isaiah, says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. See, Satan, this is what happened. Satan wanted to take God's place, and for his arrogance, for his arrogance, he lost everything he was given, and he was ultimately cast down out of heaven. But Satan was about to take this line down, was he? Ah, uh, he, was, he was mad, and he wanted revenge. So he sought to destroy the very creation that God loved so much. So the first 
cherub that I'm introducing you today to is, is the bad guy. This is the villain. Okay, this is Satan. But he's not the only cherub that we read about in the Bible, is he? We do read about other cherubs, but the second one that I'm going to introduce you to today is also mentioned in Genesis. And Genesis tells us that God created this beautiful garden for Adam and Eve. And what was the name of that garden? Eden, okay? The Garden of Eden. And God, he created two special trees in the middle of that garden. It was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. So God really only gave Adam one simple commandment, didn't he? One simple commandment. And notice I'm saying Adam, okay? I haven't mentioned Eve, have I? Okay? But listen, this, this is why, because in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, this is what God says. He says, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, we all kind of know how that turned out, don't we? Yep. You know, really, there's not a lot of difference between what happened there of just kind of disobeying God and, and, and what Satan did, is there? Not a lot of difference. Because we felt that we could be better than God. That's really what happened. We felt that we don't need to follow his commandments. In this case, one commandment. But here's the thing is that Satan, yes, he deceived the woman, convincing her that if she ate of the tree, it would make her wise like God. So she bit on the temptation, literally, right? And then she bit on the fruit. And then she gave it to her husband, and then he bit. And then God came down for a visit and then confronted them about their disobedience. And then he proclaimed curses on Satan, on Adam, and on Eve. And we're told that God said in Genesis 3, 22 to 24, this is what God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, guess what he did? He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So this is the second cherubim that we're, ta we're reading about right now and, and that I'm talking about to you. And what's going on here? I mean, why would God have a cherub guard the tree of life? Why would he do that? Well, it's because Adam and Eve, they sinned. It's because they ate of the tree that God commanded them not to eat. And you remember the punishment for eating of the tree of knowledge? What is it? What's the punishment? Death. That's right. It was death. So the punishment for eating of that tree is death. And Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. We're very familiar with that. Okay, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And as long as they could eat of the tree of life, though, guess what? They wouldn't die. So they probably would have lived forever, even though they made that decision. But their sin had robbed that from them. There was a change that happened. God cannot allow them to eat from that tree of life because they had broken the one commandment that he told them. So what does God do? He places that cherubim in front of the tree of life to guard it from the hands of sinful men. And so death reigned in a once perfect world. And, and this is what I'm seeing here is that cherubim were actually entrusted with guarding things that were precious to God. Think about that. This is what they were doing. They guarded things that God found was so important, so precious. That's, that was their job. So creation, important to God. Life, important to God. All these things, okay, important to God. So let me repeat that. Cherubim were entrusted with guarding things that were precious to God. And Satan was entrusted with protecting the, the gift of God's world. And he failed at that miserably, didn't he? But that was his responsibility. That was his job. And the, the cherub in the garden was entrusted with guarding the, the tree of life, protecting the tree of life. 
But there's a third gift. There's a third gift that God had the cherubim protect. And we're going to talk about that gift today. And you're going to see how this ties together here. In Exodus 25, 17 through 22, we read about how Moses is told how the Ark of the Covenant is to be crafted. Now, let's, let's listen to this. This is what, what God says to, to, to Moses. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. And in fact, I'm going to have, uh, once we, we finish reading this, I'm going to have them pull up a picture of this. Okay. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on, on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from above the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Now we're going to pop that uh, picture up there real quick of, of the ark. Once they, there you go. Okay, and there's, there's different depictions, but this is a pretty close depiction of what the ark more likely looked like. And this is how the cherub would have actually looked on the ark. You can see them up top there. And what does it look like these cherubim are doing? Do you see how their wings are spread over the top of the lid? It's as if they are shielding or protecting that part of the ark. So what's special, what's so special about that, that part of the ark that's up there? That is where the blood of the sacrifice was placed on the Day of Atonement. Okay, so right above there, that mercy seat is where that blood of the sacrifice was placed. And it's called, it's the area beneath their wings was actually called the mercy seat. Okay, so it's called the mercy seat because God has declared that when the blood of an innocent sacrifice was placed on that mercy seat, he would have mercy on his people. He would regard their sins as covered by that innocent blood. So the cherubim are actually protecting this part of the ark. If you look at the way their wings are spread out right on top of there, they're standing guard over the most precious place in God's theology. Now, this is what's really interesting. What do you think is inside the Ark of the Covenant? Does anybody have any idea? We have the Ten Commandments. The staff, that's right. Aaron's, Aaron's rod. And what else? Manna, okay. And Hebrews 9, 4 actually tells us that this Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. So inside the Ark of the Covenant was a jar of manna, Aaron's rod that had budded miraculous, miraculously, and then the stone tablets. By the way, what was on the stone tablets? Ten Commandments, okay? Or really the law, right? Okay, this is God's law, and the law declared the righteousness of God, and the law declared the unrighteousness of sin, okay? And the law prescribed the punishment for sin. And what was the punishment for sin? What was that punishment? Death, okay? So we're going to come back to that. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if we've all sinned, what do we deserve? We deserve death, right? And, and I think most of us who've been believers for a while, we understand that. that we, that's really our, what we deserve. We deserve death. I have this conversation sometimes with with kids, and this is a tough one. This is, this is a question that you may have with people that, you know, are, are curious about who we are. And that question is, are people, are they inherently good, or are they inherently bad? What are they? We are inherently bad. Okay? This is a tough one, because if you believe you're inherently good, well, then you believe everything that goes against you 
is terrible. Okay? You believe that you are not at fault for the things that happen in your life. It really turns your, your whole theology around. But God tells us that the wages of sin is death, okay? and we are sinners. The law that prescribed death laid within the Ark of the Covenant. But on top of the Ark was this mercy seat. And the mercy seat was where the, the blood of the innocent sacrifice was going to cover the sins of the people that the law said they needed to die for. Okay? So think about that. Now we have, a, we have the law that's inside this ark, but on top of it, okay, the blood of the innocent covered those sins. Think about that. So these cherubs were placed by God to protect the mercy seat. And why do that? Why protect the mercy seat? Well, 2 Peter 3.9 kind of elaborates on that. It says, this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. See, God does not desire to destroy us. Could he destroy this world? Could he destroy us in a heartbeat? Yes, he could. And you wonder at times, how long is it going to be, right? You do. God doesn't want to drop the hammer on us. He doesn't want us to be cast aside. He doesn't want to annihilate us. He could do that with a, with a thought. He could do that with a snap of a finger, whatever it might be. That could be his choice. But here's the thing is that God is patient with us, amen? He is patient, and he's hoping that we're going to wake up to, to the fact that we need to repent and that we can be forgiven. He's waiting for us. He is waiting for each one of us to make that decision. And even at times when we've made that decision, we don't, we don't fully follow through with that, do we? We don't understand what has happened for us to have this salvation. I want you to follow this, okay? So the first cherub, Satan, he brings death to mankind. That's what he does. The second cherub, which is the one that guarded the tree of life, he enforced the punishment of death for sin. But the third set of cherubs, they were placed on the mercy seat to protect God's most valued gift. Most valued gift. And that gift is the gift of mercy, amen? The gift of mercy, the gift of life, of life eternal. And that's what he's offering us. Mercy and life, they, br they are brought about by, this, by the blood of an innocent sacrifice. And that's beautiful imagery, really, if you think about it. Talk about how things were interwoven in the Bible, about how he had this plan. And even right here, even before Jesus came along, this was part of his plan, part of the plan to defeat death, defeat sin, to be covered, because we are covered in the blood of Jesus. Amen? We are covered. See, practically every culture on the face of the earth, listen, you know, and this is a proven fact, they engaged, or they, they, they do engage or they have engaged in animal sacrifice. And why is that? It's because people realize that something had to die to pay for their sin. Okay, something had to die for them to be made right. Hindus, Muslims, many other cultures throughout history, they have sensed the need for something, and that something had to die for their sins. And of course, God drove home that, that idea throughout the Old Testament as well. And see, the death of a bull or a goat was said to bring around the forgiveness of sins. But there is a problem with that. There is a problem. We have to realize that the blood of sheep and goats can never really pay for their sins. I mean, those animals... They don't do anything to cause the sins. And those animals hadn't even volunteered to pay for the sins, did they? Listen, they were forced. I guarantee if they had a choice, they weren't going to do it. Okay? These animals were not volunteering to do it. These animals, this is part of that broken relationship that we had with God at that time. Understand that. Hebrews 10.4 tells us that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. 
So we've come to that realization now that everything that happened, as far as the Old Testament, while it was a, a quick fix or a temporary thing, it was leading up to something else. But see, God still honored those animal sacrifices as payments for sins at that time. God accepted the animal sacrifices as payment, but eventually the real payment had to be made. And who made the real payment for your sins? Jesus. Jesus made that real payment. Now, I want you to think about the mercy seat this way. Here we have this communion table in behind me, and, and uh, the table is actually, believe it or not, roughly the size of the Ark of the Covenant. It's pretty close. And picture this top of the table as if it were the Ark itself. Imagine that. So right about here, right about this area in here, would have been the mercy seat. And what happened to that mercy seat, we know, is that is where blood was shed. That's where the blood of the innocent was, was laid down, was poured down to cover our sins. 1 Corinthians 11.26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, every time you take communion, you're celebrating the fact. And yes, we are celebrating. I talked to somebody about this before too, and they said, what do you mean it's a celebration? That's a sad thing. No, 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 no. This is a celebration. Understand this. And people, again, that's the idea that are we inherently good or inherently evil? Okay? And yes, I use that word evil because that's what we are. But here's the thing is that Jesus' blood was poured out on the mercy seat. Think about that. It was the blood of an innocent, and here's the, the key part of it, a willing sacrifice that God allowed so that we could be forgiven of our guilt, forgiven of our sin, and here's the thing is it's all covered now. It's all covered. Right here at this mercy seat, this communion table. Think about how that works. We take communion once a week. I'm glad that we do. There are some that do it less often, you know, but we're actually called really to do it as often as we can. Because we have to remember, we have to remember why we take communion. We have to remember why we are forgiven. And part of that is understanding this whole thing. Understanding that there had to be an ultimate sacrifice. It's all covered. We're all covered right now. And one last thing, and, I, and as the worship team comes forward, and I could be wrong on this, but probably, I don't think I, I, don't think I am. I want you to take a look at this picture of the ark again. If you all could pull up the picture of the ark. Does it look to you uh, like, the, like the cherubim might be looking kind of downward at that mercy seat? Okay, Most pictures that are depicted, okay, and, and from what we can tell, they are actually looking downward at the mercy seat. Now, think about that as I read uh, to you 1 Peter 1.12. This is what it says. The gospel has now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into, into which angels long to look. Well, look at that. Look at that. It's kind of like those angels are on the ark. They're looking into something, aren't they? They long to look on it. They're excited about God's plan for man's salvation. Do you remember Jesus' comment in Luke 15.10? There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One sinner. The angels are excited beyond all imagination. Let's sum it up. The sound of cherub wings was like the sound of the voice of the Almighty God. Listen to that sound. It was the sound of sin, which Satan uh, when Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve. And it's the sound of judgment, like the angel guarding the tree of life. And it's the sound of mercy through the blood of Jesus. Amen? See, that's the gospel, and that's what we all need to be acceptable to God. 
Angels wish they would love to have the same opportunity that we do to be able to have that relationship with God in a manner that they cannot. They cannot. Angels are amazing creatures, but you know what? God found us more amazing than even the angels who he created. He found us more amazing, and he looked at us to the point that he said, I am willing to give my son for each one of you, for each one of us. I'm willing to shed his blood on that mercy seat one final time. And for me, you can, how can he sit there and look at that offer that he has made to us and say, I'm not going to take it. Why take chances with the fact that I could be given eternal life in a place of death? I want eternal life in heaven, amen? So if we have never made that decision to follow Christ, if you are ready to do that today, if you're ready to understand that I need to accept this offer that he has made to me, this offer to cover us in Jesus' blood, if you're ready to make that decision, make it today. And brothers and sisters, as we, we come into this time, maybe we're studying our lives, we're looking and saying, you know what, I really didn't understand fully why I have this opportunity, but now I do. And you're ready to say, I'm going to serve God fully. If you're ready to do that, today's the day to do it. And our numbers are few today, but God uses a few people to do a lot, doesn't he? He used one son to save an entire world. And he will use each one of us as a body of Christ, as part of the body, to do his work. And if you're ready to do that, to join a body of Christ that's willing to do that, I say do it. So let's stand as we sing this final song and we think about this fact that we are covered in Jesus' blood, amen. Think about that fact as we sing this final song.